Hey everyone, time for another report. So, AI Dungeon 2, an open AI-driven Dungeon Master, has been making waves. The dev calls it an AI-generated text adventure, the first of its kind. And from the website, it says this, a pretty bold claim. Unlike virtually every other game in existence, you are not limited by the imagination of the developer in what you can do. As I said, bold, but it is technically true. Developed by Nick Walton and a few other colleagues, it uses OpenAI's GPT-2 language model, trained with around 30 30 megabytes of curated text from ChooseYourStory.com. The GPT-2 model, basically what it tries to do is predict the next word in text, and it's been extremely good at doing that so far. So good, in fact, that OpenAI actually refused to release the full model when they first developed it, because they basically said it could create ungodly amounts of very believable but entirely fake articles. Effectively, in the wrong hands, it could just pump out an extreme amount of super hard to filter noise into the public sphere. I actually recommend leading uh, reading the article, it will be linked below because it's a pretty darn wild situation. Now, in this case, the dev Nick Walton had already seen some success with the first AI dungeon, although it was severely limited by using a less capable GPT-2 model. It had uh, generated prompts to choose from rather than offering total freedom. AI Dungeon 2, though, it is a very different story. In fact, it's so different of a story that the developer himself was surprised by the explosive popularity of this, finding that, well, the hundreds of thousands of visitors actually ended up costing around 10 grand a day in cloud bandwidth fees. Now, he did get around this, and he now offers a 5 gig download that's hosted peer-to-peer -peer using BitTorrent. Now, this isn't actually a case of downloading and just, you know, running it on your laptop, though. A neural net of this size takes serious power to run. Nick suggests that nothing shy of an NVIDIA card with 12 gigs of VRAM will be able to cope. Now, there are two ways to play this. Firstly, there is playing it for free. That makes use of Google's Colab Research tool. However, the developer says uh, only do that if you've got to. Server and bandwidth costs can get insane, and a lot of power is needed to actually run the neural net AI. He currently estimates actually that each user is costing him an extra $1 a month. Now, the other way to play is via the official app, but that's locked behind a $5 per month paywall on Patreon, which, I mean, is fair enough. The man did make this thing. Now, currently that Patreon is on eight grand a month, but that's actually a far cry from his apparent 65 grand costs. Turns out access to a lot of that AI stuff is extremely expensive. And certainly overall, I'd say that given how many flash in the pan websites actually pop up, never even charging the user, it is a unusual situation. I mean, it really is a shame that the costs here might not actually allow the developer to make money from their work, because this certainly is a novel thing, and it's a lot of fun. So hopefully he's able to figure out a way of just making the hosting not be so expensive there. Now as for how AI Dungeon 2 actually plays, well, I'd say it's very much like a lucid dream. Uh, rather than your subconscious, though, it is using a combination of the last few interactions and then the data from its training set. Now, given the limitations there, it can derail pretty qui uh, quickly and that ultimately gives you a surreal feeling that's actually quite fun. So it doesn't really understand, say, the context of some of your actions, although it can create extremely powerful links. Now, this is a result of GPT-2's model of understanding English, but really not that much else. Now, occasionally it does latch onto ideas and they can be followed, although that might be because of existing stories in its training data set. As an example, it got oddly hung up on the existence of an all-girls magic school. As soon as it got onto that topic, it remained coherent and small pushes into other topics led to an interesting uh, blend, uh, some of which I don't even know if I can repeat here on YouTube. Ultimately though, I think it feels more like an intelligent chatbot than like an adventure game and it's not super creative. And now, some of the stories that it's created have been really fantastic, but much of that relies on the user making it fun. It does feel like a bot that will sort of auto-complete a story for you, rather than a context-aware dungeon master. All the same, though, I think it's an exceptional look into the future of AI-generated fiction, and given the right themes, training, and prompts, something like this could actually create something quite compelling. Now, that said, it's not super creative. It does combine tropes and themes together, and it's never really that intelligent. Most of the stories being shared, I mean, they're funny because of how absurd they are, or how tropes combine in an unusual and uh, just an interesting way. You know, almost none of them are compelling or interesting stories in their own right, so for now, it feels more like the novelty than anything else, and just that it does create something weird and surreal. It's like how in, I mean, you know, you don't have writers in a lucid dream, right? In a lucid dream, you know, you can just add in whatever context you want, 
want, and uh, the dream world will just kind of make that be the case. And that really is the, I'd say the uniquely janky, interesting thing about this that means that even though you're sitting there thinking like, what is going on in this crazy virtual world, you are actually getting a, a pretty compelling, just a neat narrative experience. What I would say though, from a more analytical point of view, is that the most interesting part of this technology in the industry is yet to come. Uh, while this iteration wouldn't see much use from a video game's perspective, I think it's easy to see how this kind of thing could be used when trained correctly. Training this kind of, you know, thing with a specific story could result in the capability of hitting some of the same beats and themes. I mean, it's just a neural net designed to understand English, and right now, you know, it's just being used to imitate stories. So imagine if our good friend Todd Howard got his hands on this and just fed the entire Elder Scrolls series quest text to it. As funny as that would be, uh, I mean, there actually would be serious potential there for a future version of this reducing some of the busy work needed to be done by some creatives. I mean, they would need to make higher level creative decisions, right? Uh, but there are times where maybe using a guided AI to do some bulk work for even just placeholder stuff could be useful. I mean, maybe it could be the equivalent of just getting a bunch of juniors in to farm out content. And I think there's a part of all of us that could balk at that, but the same is actually happening over in the realm of art, and it's actually much more commercially viable over there. So Paint Chainer is a neural net that takes color prompts and it colors line art. Now, it's far from perfect, but it already does a pretty admirable job, like way faster than a human could. That's not really ideal, but, you know, artists and writers could see some of their work be assisted using tools like this, but I think a lot more development would be needed, and we really are looking a decent bit into the future here. Really, it does just look like, though, computing power is at the stage where all we need to solve is the implementation of this type of thing. Now, the first group of AI researchers to really nail this for a commercial application, I mean, they're going to make a lot of money. I think it will change some aspects of the creative industries. I mean, just look at, uh, I mean, just look at, say, Adobe, you know, your object selection tools in Photoshop, they're AIs that are trained. I mean, if you want to just use the object selection tool, it's incredibly useful, and that's trained off an AI. That's an AI replacing some busy work that maybe a junior or, you know, the lead creator, like, would actually have to do. I mean, there's also other quite interesting examples of when things like this might not be useful for final production, but could be quite quite useful for doing quick tests. I'm actually going to give you an example of something that we were testing. At one point, we actually tested using one of those to create a fake voice for me, such that whenever a script was actually finished uh, being written, well, you know, if I was like out and I wasn't able to record it, we could, you know, just feed it through the AI, get like an audio file back, and that would be able to help the editors actually time a video, even though I hadn't even recorded it yet. So that could be the sort of thing that in our workflow could be quite useful from a production like perspective. So not actually creating content, but just helping, you know, reduce bottlenecks within the workflow. You've then got things like say the radiant questing system in Skyrim. It sucked, didn't it? But imagine if you've got a smarter Radiant Quest system that's able to use something like this to generate more novel content for players. I think there's there's things like that that could be quite interesting. If you look at a game like, say, Elite Dangerous, it's a massive procedural game but the thing is, it's actually a tiny game in some other ways because it's so copy-paste. It is so systemic. If you're able to use tools like, say, what we've covered here, you could maybe have more interesting and unique, uh, you know, systems in a game like that in terms of their narrative content. So I think you can see here, it's not the sort of thing that's going to be replacing high-tier creative work, but it could be the type of thing that will just be an interesting tool, something that could, uh, you know, open up some new possibilities. I don't think it's going to take over massively, and I think if it did take over, that would probably be a bad thing overall, but just the fact that stuff like this is now becoming possible, it does make you think, what's going to happen in 20 years, right? When, you know, I, I'm in my 40s, uh, technology's moved on, I mean, if I look at, you know, what did phones look like when I was five years old? What do they look like now? If we're going to see a similar thing going on with AI and machine learning developments, I think you really are going to see that. And what's more important here, what I really want to impart to you is, right now, you know, you have this very slow research and development phase for a lot of technologies, but then what happens is it hits commercial viability. And as soon as it hits that, the whole growth machine just takes off. And I think that's something you're going to see happen pretty darn soon with technologies like this. So there you go, that is AI Dungeon. And I think more importantly, what I wanted to talk about was the broader implications of technology such as this on our industry. So do let me know what you think about this down below. And if you have played AI Dungeon 2, let me know, like, what kind of wild stories have you got? I'd, I'd love to hear. So cheers. I'll see you next time.